Hello, everyone. Welcome to Design in Dialogue. My name is Mario Ballesteros, and I'm the guest curator of the most recent show at Friedman Benda in New York City, uh, Everything Here is Volcanic, which showcases a very diverse range of works by 15 Mexican designers and artists, including Frida Escobedo, Tesontle, and Fernando Lapos, who will be joining us for this special series of design and dialogue interviews. And we're very happy and excited to have Fernando with us today. Hi, Fernando, how are you? Hello, I'm all right. Uh, saying hi to all of you from Mexico City. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining this uh, series of interviews and being part of the show and the project. Um, and we, I just wanted to get started uh, with you talking a little bit about your early sort of dive into design, your early works. Uh, how how was it that you fell into design? <laughs> um, well, I come from a creative family, if you want to see it that way. My mom's a painter. Uh, my dad's a baker. So it's always been being close to materials, whether that might be like building materials or cooking materials. Um, so actually, probably, you know, one of my first projects out of uh, university was kind of looking at how I could hack certain industrial processes, but rather than using, you know, industrial materials, I could do it with kitchen materials. So this is an example of a very early work. <laughs> Uh, where I started to play around with sugar um, and try to really understand its material qualities um, and trying to manipulate it like glass. So I did everything from, you know, rotation casting to mouth, you know, almost like mouth glass blowing, but, you know, using just kind of like a rail pipe from my closet and uh, mm. <laughs> and sugar that I was using in my stove. Um, and you know, that eventually led to slightly more complex pieces like, you know, 3D printed capsules that you could uh, ingest. Um, and I was doing, you know, events for companies in London. I think this was a really interesting time in a way in London. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, by the way, I studied in London. In yeah, that's what I was going to say for, for people that don't know your work. Uh, you studied at Central St. Martins in London, correct? Yes, yes. Back in, um, I started my degree in 2007. Um, so I was uh, I was about to say, like, I think a lot of this type of work w was really from a time in London uh, during the financial crisis uh, of 2008, you know, like basically the financial crisis happened in the middle of my degree. And um, the result of that was like, basically no one was hiring you. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was broke. Yeah. So so I think uh, there was a big kind of push in, in places like London or, or like the Netherlands um, for this kind of self-production, DIY production, uh, low cost materials, maximum creativity kind of thing, you know. So um, so I think this this kind of work, even though it's very early in my career and very different from what I do now, it was a very formative one because it was about really being resourceful with materials that costed nothing. Uh, you know, you could get a pound of sugar for a British pound. Uh, so it was it was um, a really nice way of just kind of really putting your design skills at use, you know, uh, aesthetically, mechanically and experimentally. Yeah. It's something that was super low cost. And also, um, I think this was a great early project because it was a very good learning curve on how to also turn an idea into a financially viable idea, you know. Um, I started working for alcohol brands eventually, uh, putting up events, um, and there was a whole aspect of like, how do you calculate your production? How do you, you know, make sure that things get there on time, that things are communicated properly? You know, this project was a really nice early one because it was, it was a prototype for a small business mm -hmm. that started from, you know, nothing, uh, just playing around in the kitchen. Um, but, you know, trying to manipulate something that is super cheap into something that has this kind of more premium quality. 
Yeah, um, I, I, I'm really interested in this fact of being in London at that time during the recession. And it's something that I, I wanted to ask you because I, I, I also lived in Europe uh, shortly thereafter. And I, I, I have a sense that what was happening specifically in London at that time uh, was had some strange but really interesting connections with like conditions that we're very used to in Mexico. And this is something that we were talking about in the last interview with with Glenn, uh, the connections between Italy and Mexico. And now I think uh, in a more sort of contemporary context uh, during the recession, uh, I think there was a, a strong sort of identification with what was going on in London at the time. There's a, a bunch of young designers at the time were using sort of these very even makeshift strategies of working with uh, sort of on the fringes of the formal practice, uh, w looking for uh, reuse of materials or finding like humble materials, elevating them. And I, I remember at the time feeling like a very intense uh, sort of energy coming out of places like London, where the situation was pretty rough and tough and how that really changed the way um, design was practiced and taught in a lot of these places. Do you feel that your being in London at the time helped you sort of like under, or, or was it something that you understood being Mexican and knowing what working in this type of conditions is like? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you have to be pragmatic, you know, and, and, um, this was the time to be pragmatic and to be entrepreneurial. You know, I think Mexican designers in general are very entrepreneurial because you don't have the infrastructure of something like the British Council or something like, you know, a big support for the arts by the government, which you have in Europe, which was a little bit of a test drive back then. You know, I mean, this was at a time where no one had money, including the government. So I think, yeah, yeah it was a bit of a... <laughs> the third world experience in a first world country, you know? <laughs> and so who better prepare than a Mexican to infiltrate this situation? <laughs> um, Tell so us a little bit about this project, which I loved from, I think this was one of the first projects of yours I, I was familiar with and I saw. Yeah, so this was, you know, within this kind of vein of, of looking for my material. You know, I think back then, if you're talking about that that time in London, it was really, a really exciting time because I feel like a lot of young designers were trying to find their voice and, 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 and modulate that voice through a material and a material that would be theirs, you know? And so this is another kind of material experimentation that I did using, uh, you know, making, making soap basically from uh, the fat and trimmings from all the butchers around my neighborhood in, in Tottenham in North London. And, um, you know, it was, again, like a really kind of like extreme transformation so from eventually the dirtiest, nastiest things from a butcher <laughs> shop into big blocks of soap that I would put on the lathe and I would turn and I would texture. And, and, and in this case, it was an amazing material to turn into a sculpture medium almost, you know, because it's so easy to carve and it's so easy to manipulate. Um, but yeah, this was the this was the kind of setting at, in London at the time. You know, it was it was just kind of jumping around from one material to the other, trying to soak myself in into the scene and and learn as much as I could from from people. And 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 you know that I think is what led me to start this relationship with the two women that were kind of my great mentors in my time in London. Could you tell to... us a little bit about your time working with Bethan and Faye? Yeah. Um, so, you know, in Central St. Martins back then, attendance was quite lax. You know, you could perfectly not go to school a lot <laughs> and still graduate, which is exactly what I did. Um, so, we, you know, I would go perhaps just one day of the week to school and then the rest I would be interning uh, first with Bethan and then with Faye Too Good. And, uh, you know, they were really... I, I really believe in this model of master apprentice, you know, that I think you see all the way from the Greek philosophers to the great painters of the Renaissance. You always had this kind of continuation of a of a thought line, uh, which I think that was sort of the, the vibe as well in London at the time. You know, if mm -hmm. if, if if you look at at Beth and especially, you know, he she was kind of emulating uh, what she learned from Martino, which in turn was 
you know, a, a product of the whole Ron Arad school. Um, and I feel like, you know, in my in my own humble way, I kind of like have continued that line. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, maybe if we go to the next slide, I can talk a little bit more about what I learned with each of them. But in the case of Bethan, for example, if you look at my corn market tree on the side, on the right side, it's really, you know, pretty much just employing the technique that I learned from Bethan, but making it my own with my own materials. Um, so I owe a lot to Bethan because she she kind of like not only gave me a, a very practical skill, but also, you know, she's the queen of pattern making. She's the queen of color. Uh, she's the queen of playfulness. And I think that was a, a, a great lesson to learn from her. Um, not be afraid of being bold, hmm. uh, not be afraid of using color. <laughs> And uh, and really like you know sticking to your aesthetic, I think that was something that was was super super special about Bethan and about London at the time. You know, it was really not about trying to copy something else from somewhere else. It was about making your own world. Um, and in the case of Faye, I think you know it was probably aesthetically the total polar opposite of Bethan. Um, but I think what I learned from Faye was this kind of rawness of materials that is, is really a big part of her work and also the world of textiles you know I, you know she's been always dancing this line between uh, design and fashion uh, she also comes from a world of of magazine publishing so the aesthetics the refinement of images the power of images and storytelling uh, it's something that I really kind of learned and, and and practice while while I was first internet and working for Faye, mm. you know, this, this was maybe about five years that I was involved in the studio. Yeah. And so, um, so these two ladies really like shape kind of like my, my aesthetic vision and some of my design principles and open a lot of doors for me. I'm very grateful for both of them and, and for that time that I spend there. Yeah. And I think an, another very sort of evident parallel is this, uh which which was very true to the type of work that was being produced in london at the time is also uh like the strong uh influence of craft and really uh like thinking through making like this very sort of seamless integration of thought of narrative of critique into a very sort of hand hands-on driven practice uh which in a way is also a very interesting parallel to the tradition of, of design in Mexico, which has always completely been immersed and connected to thinking through hand making. Uh, and I feel that also these very first experiences and your early work reflects that um, sort of that conviction as well. Yeah, completely. And I think, you know, I mean, Britain is extremely interesting because of that, you know, it's the place of the industrial revolution, but it's also the place of the craft movement. Mm -hmm. There's been a constant coming and going of a veneration for the mass produced and a total rejection, rejection of it, you know. So I think uh, um, definitely my kind of upbringing in Mexico with a fine kind of eye for craftsmanship played a big role here. But it's a, it's a very different context, you know. I mean, craft in Mexico is out of necessity, and London is more of an intellectual decision. Um, yeah, and I mean, this is this is you know one of my first kind of like dives into the the plant fiber world. Mm -hmm. uh, this is working with Lufa, and I think this was actually done at the time where I was like still working for Faye, and then it was you know trying to dominate it all the way from furniture to even going to, almost into fashion. Uh, it was really kind of like, you know, flexing those technical skills of like how how much can you control and transform this material? You know, in the case of this image on the right, mm -hmm. it's just panel working. It's, it's, it's a really kind of like amazing pattern making challenge, which I did thanks to a collaboration that I did with a group of students that were studying fashion and CSM. So also, you know, Centro St. Martin's as an institution was an incredibly, incredibly interesting place because you have some of the most talented designers you know, in the world, especially in fashion there, and this cross discipline where you could play around and go and talk to someone from the fashion course or from the ceramics course, or, you know, it was like a big kind of factory of skills and design that was, that was super interesting. And it's within this context that I started to play around with plant fiber. And what drew you specifically to like natural fibers or, or 
what was the most interesting aspect of of working with this type of materials and and what made it stick because now it's become sort of a signature of your work yeah i think at the time you know i i wasn't too sure if i could stay in london it was it was a a, a bit of a ticking time bomb which was mm -hmm. my my immediate <laughs> imminent <laughs> deportation because of a government <laughs> change at the time <laughs> i didn't have a european passport back then my visa was about to expire and um you know i started to really ask myself well could i design within this very kind of like industrial world or industrial material world in a place like mexico and you know the answer was no like like i'm a big kind of believer of this concept of the of the terroir you know the 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 geographical cultural territory uh, traits that make a product specific of a place you know it's a it's a concept that's very common within the winemaking industry um, but I think it's really interesting to apply it to design and, and when thinking of the terroir of Mexico it doesn't include linoleums and laminates and you know industrial materials but mm -hmm. what we do have is this huge heritage of of um, you know weaving of plant fibers of a connection to plants and a yeah. wisdom of plants and, and, and craft applied to plants. So I think that was, that was what always felt a little bit wrong in London. There was a bit of a distance to the source. And I think I was like, well, if I want to start designing for Mexico, I need to start designing with Mexican materials and Mexican culture in mind. Um, and this is where, where I started to perhaps apply everything that I had learned in London into, you know, applying it to these materials. Yeah, and this is a good example of it. This was kind of the birth of Toto Moxley, my my um, corn marketry technique. Um, mm -hmm. And it was about this idea of being not only a designer, but a craftsman uh, at the same time. Um, so these are images of, you know, my my workshop back in Tottenham back in the day. Which was so, in, I, I mean, in a way, even in, in London at the time, like so Mexico was sort of in the back of your head because I I really am very interested in understanding how these sort of mutual learnings connected and how your own sort of original identity as a designer which is very clear now but back then maybe was still in this sort of like definition um was mexico always i mean were you drawn even even though you spent such a long time in london and were so immersed in the in the culture there um did you always think that you would come back to Mexico and was it something that I mean did you prepare to come back to Mexico as you mentioned right now I don't know I mean <laughs> I I, uh, I wanted to but I didn't want to I didn't want to leave London but I I tried I tried to get into the material culture of London and I couldn't I think there's there was something stronger there you know I think it doesn't matter that it's you know it's such a cosmopolitan city but I think at the same time it's a city that allows you to retain your cultural identity which is great and I think yeah there was this itch to design for I felt it, it was designing for a reality in a in a, in a geography that was underrepresented mm -hmm. um, and I feel like it was almost like a rediscovery of what it means to be Mexican from a distance and looking at it with fresh eyes and perhaps looking past cliches of, you know, very Mexican aesthetics and going more into like the soul of what it means to be designing and, and practicing agriculture in a place like Mexico, you know? And I think that was the thing. I started to get more and more obsessed about the root of materials, you know? Mm -hmm. And to go really to the root, you have to go to the land. You have to go to the soil. Yeah. And that's something that was incredibly hard to do in England. And I think that agricultural side, uh, you know, it's, it's Mexico. Mexico has never been an industrial place, but it's always been an agricultural powerhouse. That's mm -hmm. where a lot of our agricultural produce came from. And I think I started to obsess more and more about that. And that's what started to lead me into this research to eventually go back to Mexico. So tell us a little bit about what brought you to Oaxaca specifically and how Totomoshtle started to become a reality. So um, I had a bit of a crisis, <laughs> quarter life crisis, if you want to see that, because I was only 26 years old or 25. But uh I think, you know, I eventually had a grant to stay in the UK, uh, but it was 
limited to how much money I was making with my little sugar glass uh, business. Uh, it was it was this weird thing called a graduate entrepreneur visa. So you could be creative, but you had to be an entrepreneur and making money out of it. And there was really strict quotas of how much you had to do per year. And, you know, what started as a really cool project working with museums and gallery openings eventually ended up being something where I was doing Christmas parties for like insurance brokers, you know, and, and I remember, <laughs> I remember this really soul crushing night of just, you know, uh, just go, just, you know, just getting totally abused by some drunk insurance brokers, you know, oh and God. treating me like a waiter. And I was like, this is, this is it. You know, I can't keep on doing this. So I, I remember I went home to my studio in Tottenham. And I took a knife and I slashed all the silicon molds that, that made my sugar glass, wow. uh, which was which was my whole livelihood at the time. And I, it was literally breaking the mold. You know, I broke mm. the mold. I was like, I'm never going to do this again. Never within the context. Uh, and uh, I applied for this residency in Oaxaca that had to do with food. I think at the time, you know, it was this big kind of like food design trend. So I got that residency, uh, moved to Oaxaca for three months. And lived in this wonderful place called Casa, which is a it's a cultural center that was started by Francisco Toledo, who was a really important painter and activist in Mexico, um, you know, responsible for really protecting and making Oaxaca the cultural hub that it is today. Um, and one of his kind of big cries to war was the defense of uh, heirloom corn in Mexico, our traditional corn. And at the time of this residency, it was it was a really important, intense time because the Mexican Supreme Court was about to vote on whether to put a permanent ban on GMOs or not. And so on the one hand, you had all these companies like Monsanto and Sagenta Dow and Bayer uh, really lobbying to get this ban uh, lifted. And on the other side, you had a huge amount of activism, um, you know, which didn't only include indigenous activists, it, it included the, the broader population. And in Oaxaca, it was a really, really uh, intense time. So it was within this concept, this context that I did the uh, the residency. And this material that you're seeing in the image was the result of that. It was creating a, a, a veneer uh, to try to tackle some of the economic sides of why we were losing uh, our heirloom corn. But that eventually, you know, started as a veneer, as a material, and it, and it got completely transformed and, 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 you know, it became a really deep thing once I arrived at Tona Weeks land, this, this, this village that I know since I'm a kid. Um, so that experience uh, and, and finding sort of thinking about corn and cultivation, you know, as 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 the starting point for your work it, it sort of brought you back to uh, a very personal history could you tell us a little bit about your connection with this town in the sierra mixteca tona Wixla, how you connected the experience of working with uh totomostle as as a material and the sort of conditions of this rural community in the mountains of mexico which is very similar conditions to a lot of other small rural communities throughout the country. Yeah, I mean, I think going to Tona Wixla was 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 a really cathartic moment uh, because I mean, I'll show you some. Uh, you know, I think we have a, a slide afterwards of, of my childhood time in Tona Wixla. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we could start with this one and go back to the other one. But, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, um, Dona Wixla is this incredible like indigenous place, uh, the indigenous community in the southwest of Mexico in what's called the, the Mixteca Mountains. And um, I had a first encounter with Dona Wixla when I was six years old because of this man in the picture, Delfino. Delfino uh, used to work for my father in his bakery. And, um, you know, he, um, he became incredibly close to our family. And uh, my parents basically trusted him and his wife with me and my sister. And, uh, you know, they started sending us to their village when we were kids. I think, you know, for my parents, it was a, a bit of, oh, yeah, let's, let's get them exposed to another reality of Mexico. But also it was like, yeah, this is the most amazing and cheapest summer camp, you know, let's send them there. So, 
so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, being exposed to Tona Wixla at such a young age uh, was an incredibly formative experience because it's an indigenous village, you know, the main language is in Spanish. Uh, for me, I think from a, from a really young age, being exposed to this diversity of people that we have in Mexico was a total eye opener, you know, I mean, people here speak another language, eat completely different food, live within completely different philosophy or in rhythm of life. You know, I probably, as a young kid, would have had more in common to a young kid in London than to a young kid in this, in this indigenous town within my own country. So it's like going to a different world and to a different time. And I think um, that's what's so special about Mexico that, you know, when, you, when you're talking about indigenous and when you're talking about indigenous cultures, you're not looking through this through books or museums. It's, it's still a culture that is alive. And, um, but unfortunately, there's massive social barriers that impede this kind of dialogue and, and uh, relationships, you know, between uh, the urban and especially the white urban elites and, um, you know, uh, our indigenous population. So, so for me, it was a really great experience to live through that at an age where I didn't have prejudices yet, racial prejudices. And I was seen as a, this inoffensive little blonde kid, you know. Um, so I also wasn't posing a, a threat to anyone in this village. And, and I think that was the, the beginning of a really kind of loving uh, relationship that I had with the whole town. Um, and I think something that was, for me, very eye-opening from the very beginning was, was this, you know, looking at the agricultural legacy of these places. Uh, so these are some of the coins. I mean, this is, these are comes from our last harvest, but these were the kind of corns that I remember as a child seeing there, which were completely different from the corns that I, that I remember in the city, you know? And this is what's so incredible about Tonan Wixla. Tonan Wixla sits about 80 kilometers from the oldest archeological site that evidences the beginnings of corn domestication, you know? If we, if we look at corn nowadays, it's this kind of weird man-made plant, the result of this massive selective breeding process. Um, we we don't find corn like this in nature, and and it all started 80 kilometers from this village. So thinking about losing the corn at the core at it, at its epicenter was for me a massive eye opener and, and 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 a big drive to start this project. For people that don't know the context of like Mexico, what was the situation like when you went back to the town uh, years after? Um... So. So I think, you know, what's really kind of special about um, corn is that it has this abnormal consumption of nitrogen. It, it's, a, it's a super, super taxing crop on the land. And the ancient Mesoamericas of the Central Valleys of Oaxaca and Puebla realized this, realized that if you just plant corn, you completely mess up your soil. So they, they devised this indigenous permaculture technique called the, the, the milpa where you combine maize, beans, and pumpkins so that all of these plants work together. Nitrogen is, is being fixed back into the soil. The pumpkins act as a weed uh, control system. And you have a multi-crop uh, harvest. And you don't need a crop rotation. It's really a brilliant thing. Um, and that's the way that agriculture has been practiced for the past 8,000 years. <laughs> and this is a system that kind of came to an end massively uh, mm -hmm. in the 90s following this massive free trade agreement between Mexico, the United States and Canada. Um, what happened was, you know, and I think this is what's so important for me is that is to realize that this massive market changes can have such an impact in such a localized community that has absolutely no part in this, in this trade, you know? Uh, basically what happened in the late nineties is when, from one year to the other, the price of corn dropped by two thirds. So people had to produce three times more if they wanted to make the same as the previous year. And the only way to do that is by using a lot of chemicals. Um, and so that put an end to the, to the milpa system, especially because of the weed killers. Uh, the weed killers like, you know, only allowed corn to grow. It turned into a monoculture and eventually a massive erosion problem, which essentially caused a massive migration problem. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's it's interesting to look at all of these complexities uh, when you're talking about a material problem.
Yeah, and obviously it's a it's a problem that was very evident in in Tona Wixla, but that was replicated in t small towns and rural communities all over the country. So really, I mean, your your delving into this problem is at a micro scale, but really you're pointing at like these systemic sort of issues that impact lots of communities, not only in Mexico, but everywhere, I, I would suppose. Completely. I mean, and I think what was really interesting was this. It's like it's like seeing that all around the world, you know, the corn is the most planted grain in the world right now. But, you know, how many people eat corn daily? Like not many, at least not in, not in corn form. <laughs> you do yeah. it as uh, sugar additives through, you know, uh, animal feed, etc. So for me, it was really interesting to have this kind of like contrast, you know, how an indigenous town where corn is basically still a, a sacred plant uh, has their kind of whole existence turned upside down because the rest of the world decides that corn is per perfectly fine more to making, you know, bioplastics or ethanol or sugars or fattening cows. Uh, I think at the end of the day, what it is, is a tension. It's a tension of, of a hyper capitalism and a hyper indigenous reality, you know. Um, so this is an image of Delfino, probably 25 years after that first photo uh, of me as a child. And I think what's really interesting is that Delfino became the indigenous leader of the indigenous assembly of his town and started to organize his town to kind of try to fix a lot of these agricultural and social problems. Um, this is a still from a video that I, I don't think we're going to be able to play, but basically in this still, he's he's explaining how, yes, this, this kind of global, yeah, go to the next slide. This global market changes can affect subsistence farmers, you know, with devastating ecological and social consequences. Um, you know, Tona Wichita was never a town that wanted to become millionaires through their corn trade. They just wanted to leave and be able to have... Um, food independence you know they, they've always been poor but they've I've always been able to feed themselves um this is another clip from Esmeralda who is uh one of the girls that works in the in the workshop that we established in their village and and she is uh she has a, a really amazing personal story because uh she lost two of her brothers uh while they were trying to cross to the United States uh they didn't make the, the travel and and it was a big family tragedy and I think this is the reality of a lot of these uh, rural migrants, you know, um, maybe I think the next slide kind of summarizes that, but, um, you know, I think a big part of the problem is to humanize migration, you know, um, the majority of indigenous rural migrants, which now represent the majority of migrants to the United States, they're not escaping violence uh, and they're not chasing the American millionaire dream that no one wants like a Lamborghini and to be you know a, a celebrity <laughs> they just want to live and they just want to like maintain their families so I think what 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 really is at stake here is 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 this kind of tension that I was mentioning earlier it's you know more than victims of violence there are victims of a of a corporate violence of a global system that is completely incompatible with their traditional lifestyle, you know? And, and I do believe that they are the most underrepresented uh, people in the world right now because they have a double disadvantage, you know? They, they have the racial and ethnic uh, discrimination against them, but also the way they live is completely at odds with this kind of post-capitalist world, you know? So, so uh, they're doubly misfitting. Um, so this was the challenge when I was starting this, this project how can we bring corn back without also replicating this very extractive strategies that has become almost the norm in Mexico where you know you have fancy chefs kind of taking all the good corn and selling it for a premium in Mexico City or exporting it to New York or whatever uh, and using this kind of like uh, rhetoric of indigenous materials as a, a seal of authenticity, you know? Mm. So I, the idea here is like, let's not take the grain. Let's leave the grain for them. Let's, let's get them to eat healthy again. And uh, let's look at what we can do with what would be considered a waste, you know? Mm. Um, so the evident thing was looking at, at the leaves because these husks basically are super colorful. And it's, it's I think what's make, what makes it like super evident that they're not industrial corn, you know? The color is 
it's just so incredible and they grow like that from from the ground you know uh, i don't paint them or dye mm -hmm. them in any way uh, that's what's so magical about them and that is the testament of the biodiversity that has been created by our cultural diversity Definitely. for thousands of years you know Yeah, I think it's incredible. I mean, people that see this project, Totomostle, and even people from Mexico who we should be very familiar with this sort of reality, which, which as you mentioned, I mean, grew out of the deepest sort of aspects of our own culture. And people just don't understand that this is the natural way corn is meant to be and look like. And lots of people who see these works, they're like, what do you mean it's not dyed or painted? <laughs> um, it's really incredible, like that disconnect from something that is so representative and at the root of uh, like culture and civilization in places like Mexico. Um, and so I think it's, yeah, I, I, I just think it was a, a, a genius idea to focus on not only this beautiful, very compelling sort of material, but also, as you mentioned, uh, that it's a, a, a waste, you know, and adding and finding a way to add value to the production and the re um, sort of recovering these native corns through uh, uh, a, a waste material, which really makes it a very round sort of circular and very contemporary uh, approach to, to a design project, I think. Yeah, so these are some of the, you know, the results of that. And it was, again, you know, employing this kind of marketry technique that I learned in London, but making it my own. And, and marketry became the obvious choice because you're limited by the size of the leaf you know so so you can't just have like a full four by eight sheet of corn veneer you have to make it out of little pieces somehow and and uh, marketry became not only a functional solution to this but also a very aesthetic one um so these are some images of that and how do people usually react to this story and when they see the objects and feel feel the material and realize that behind these beautiful objects that you really don't understand fully when you see them for the first time uh there's all this story behind them what's your i mean what's the reaction been to to this project in your experience i mean in a lot of cases it's like wow tell me more i want to learn everything about all the agricultural practices behind it um and in many others it's like oh but can i spill red wine on this and how do you <laughs> seal it and uh can you give me all the you know pantone colors of your uh range of 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 color uh, of natural corn you know i think it's like uh it's a very it's a very interesting project in that sense you know because you have you have people that only approach it from a material point of view and and are very skeptical about its durability or if, if its feasibility or even question why would you be even doing this you know and mm -hmm. then you have the po the polar opposite which is people that really are into like wow like this is a super deep project, you know? So it depends. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so really this, I mean, this versatility, I, I think you've proven the versatility of it and because it's a project that you've been developing for years now, correct? Yeah. We started in 2015. So we're eight, deep, eight, eight years deep. And I think, you know, it's a project that is constantly involve, evolving. It's really interesting to see how, you know, whenever I get interviewed or something by a design um, publication, they're always like, oh, but don't you have a new project? You know, like we've been doing, you know, we've covered this. This is an old thing. But when you talk to someone that knows about agriculture or knows about regeneration or all this, it's like, wow, you're just starting. I mean, mm. you haven't even been doing this for a, a decade. You're just starting. It's already such a successful thing, you know, but you're just starting. So I think this other metrics of time are really interesting. And I think yeah. this is something that I've been trying to push as well as a design conversation. You know, you have to be able to be patient and to watch things really grow and mature and and and, and be real uh, if you really want to achieve true sustainability. And I think that has become like a signature of your work as a designer as well, like really having this, which would seem like again, like an absurdity or a luxury for people who are used to, you know, going with the cycles of 
what are you presenting in the next fair or in the next uh, Biennale or Triennale? So these this project that has you've been working on for years uh, really breaks with sort of that inertia. And I think that after the pandemic, when our sense of like time and these like sort of seemingly very natural and normal schedulings uh, around these type of events was totally uh, sort of totally crashed and came down. Uh, I think it's it's very refreshing and it makes a lot of sense now in hindsight to really sort of break with those paradigms and think of these long term projects that it's not repeating itself. But it's really evolving at a at a different pace. And I do think that the sophistication of your work with Totomoshka now is years away from from what those first experiments were. Yeah, completely. And I think it needs time to mature. And and you know, if you look at, I mean, we're 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 basically creating a like a new craft, you know. And and I think that's a big part of 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 the work as well. Is um, I purposely try to never work with existing artisans. It's it, for me that's not the interesting thing. And I think this is a model that is very followed by designers in Mexico, and is a model that I'm personally very opposed to because I think it's rarely a, a fair thing you know so so for me it's more interesting as a designer to truly innovate to truly create a new material a new craft a new process and that takes years um could you tell us a little bit about the the collaboration with the actual uh seed and the research around um sort of the the agricultural aspect of the project which I think is super interesting yeah, I mean, I think at the beginning, I was really naive and I was just kind of like trying to source colored seeds and expecting that if you planted them, you would get colored corn and colored leaves. But it was not the, the case at all. We had total failures for the first like two or three seasons. Uh, and it wasn't until a seed bank saw a video that I posted online, that, you know, the director, Denise Kostic, was featured there in the, in the middle photo. Uh, she's the director of the seed bank. She was like, please let us help you. And um the the CIMIT is the big the largest seed bank in the world that, that has the largest collection of of um of, of May seeds. So uh they did a super in-depth study uh of the area, things like altitude, which are extremely important, soil quality, and they curated a selection of seeds, which were the our kind of the seed that we planted in our pioneering, our pioneer um plantation. And out of those seeds, we we had most of the seeds that we have today. Although it's a really a collaboration with the with the town as well, because once the project kind of started rolling and they started to see some results, they in turn took really a, a big interest in in trying to unearth some seeds that were locally from there but were lost. And so, for example, our our most successful breed right now is a local seed that was rediscovered by one of the ladies. So it's it's really important. And yeah, this is a big kind of diagram of how the project works. It's it's really about creating a new interest for these corn that was basically abandoned and forgotten because of a market disadvantage that was artificially created. Uh, basically, you know, the government is subsidizing super industrial corn because that's the only way of keeping tortilla cheap. Mm. And you have to understand that in Mexico, Corn is like the baguette in France, you know. If if people can't afford tortilla, heads heads roll. So so mm -hmm. corn is artificially kept cheap. So you have to find a way to create revenue for these kinds of corn. And the result of this so far is, you know, we've reintroduced eight varieties of this native corn. Uh, we have this relationship with the seed bank. We have a composting center, and we create flexible employment for a, a large chunk of the town. So you know, it's it's a project that has really matured into. A functioning business as well, which is which is interesting, and I think this is a this is a great kind of aspect of it. You know, the the added value of design, which is massive. Basically, you can get as much money out of two or three cups uh, as what you would have to produce. You know, with a whole hectare of grain, uh, almost a ton, just by making a square meter of the of the material. I mean, this is obviously because we we sell through a very niche market, but it's also because we have no competition. You're not competing with yeah. the next artisanal town next door, you know, which are going to be always kind of trying to go into a downward spiral of, uh, you know, 
making things cheaper and cheaper so they can sell more. We have a totally different model of, of how we uh, retail these things. And how, and, sorry. Yeah, go no, ahead. Please, please go ahead. Please no, go ahead. I, I'm just curious to, to, I mean, we see it in the slides, but how has this project sort of changed the dynamic of the town? How has it impacted this community? And um, after all this time, how have they sort of embraced um, and made the project their own? Yeah, so I think a big part of the design process has been not not really making the final furniture, but making a system, uh, a system that allows anyone in the village to become a crafts person uh, after a three day um, initiation course, you know, so uh, it's a lot of, you know, using cutting dies, using screen printing guides, um, uh, designing a whole system of jigs that can correct, you know, mistakes that might be handmade, you know, um, because at the end of the day, we, we are looking for really good quality, really good finish and consistency, which is something that, you know, for international markets, uh, you can tell them a really lovely story about how it's done by indigenous people, but if it's not well done, it's not well done and they're not gonna buy it. So, so part of it is like, that was a challenge. How do you create something that has the super level of quality uh, for a very demanding uh, luxury market, but done within the context of an indigenous community with minimum technology, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the fact that it's been, you know, this kind of like constant innovation with tools that go all the way from, you know, how we take the leaves off. So, for example, we made this kind of circular blade encrusted in a bench <laughs> to be really efficient with the deleafing. De um, all of these things are because I have been like personally involved in every harvest since 2015. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, you know, for anyone wanting to, in, you know, embark on a project like this, you have to move there. You have to be there. It's impossible to do at a, at a safe distance behind your computer, you know, so you really have to be there. And yeah, I think as part of the impact, you know, what we've been kind of focusing on a lot is returning migrants. You know, there's a lot of projects out there that are dealing with migrants, but it's usually arriving migrants. But what about returning migrants? You know, it's a completely different set of challenges. A lot of them are dealing with a lot of trauma, uh, mixed cultural uh, living now, you know, mm -hmm. and so... So what, what we try to do is to involve families at every step of the process to get them interested again in being farmers, uh, but with this vision of you can actually now make a living out of this mm -hmm. and uh, in a very safe, secure and fair space, you know. And so, yeah, I think, you know, when you look at why Tona Wixla is important and what we're doing there is important, you only have to look at this graph, which I got from National Geographic. It's 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 how massively the, vari the varieties of our agricultural produce has uh, diminished, you know, within the last century. It's really crazy. So, and I think we lived that during the pandemic and, 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 and we, could, we could go through a super plague as well. You know, the, the, there's a saying within the, the uh, seed saving community, um, you know, diversity means security. So the more diversity you have, uh, the more robust your food chains are going to be. And it's, a, it's incredibly important, you know, even if these corns aren't as, as robust or, as, sorry, as uh, productive as the, as the uh, industrial ones, you know, the last two years we had the worst droughts ever. And, you know, ever since the, the memory of the people in the, in the town. And uh, I mean, we had a, a pretty mediocre harvest, but we harvest this stuff. Our, our corns sustain that huge, heat and dryness and the industrial ones didn't so you know mm -hmm. the genetic information of these seeds could be the solution for a lot of the environmental challenges that we're going to see in the future um, so that's why we have to encourage them to thrive and to survive yeah and speaking of resiliency and and this uh, sort of native intelligence. I think your your projects with agave fibers also have to do with the same sort of um, principles and it's sort of an evolution of this um, first exploration of yeah. of working systemically with natural fibers. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your CISAL projects, where they come from? Because uh, it's yeah. also very surprising to a lot of people sometimes. Yeah, so I mean, my other kind of totem 
uh, um, material is agave fibers, also known as sisal. Um, these are clips from a video where I explain how I make it, but essentially, you know, the, the, the leaves from this big plant that almost looks like an aloe vera, but it's a more desertic version of that. It's are full of these long strings that are super tough, uh, that were used for centuries for making ropes and fishing nets. Um, but by beating them, you know, you can get the fibers out of them. And when you dry them, it, it, they turn into this kind of blonde color and, and, um, you know, you can, you can kind of make fibers for them. Um, mm. yeah. And so these are some of the, 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 the pieces that I've done, maybe we can just run through them. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's about like also creating this kind of like very animalistic, uh, uh kind of aesthetic because also that the material is kind of giving you all of that behavior you know like these hairs don't want to be square and and straight and with sharp corners so so you have to kind of design according to that um you know all of the pinks that you see are done with natural dyes as well um so i've been doing a lot of research and diving into the history of cochineal which is the, these insects that create this pink color um this was you know, one of the big kind of first installations that I did in Miami, where we really looked into the history of cochineal and the history of sisal, and we made this uh, super kind of like Instagrammable installation, mm -hmm. but it was all developed, uh, you know, with this community of weavers. Um, and yeah, and I think simultaneously, you know, what we've been trying to do with the agave is to also create a new way of working with it, you know, rather than twisting it and turning it into rope or string or textiles, just leaving it in its rough form, using a very simple knot system to, to create almost like a for the, for, um, yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's, it's also about kind of being whimsical with my work. Maybe this is some of the Beth and influence, but you know, it's, um, a kind of, these stories and sometimes you need to like alleviate uh it with a little bit of humor and playfulness uh mm -hmm. this for example is a is a closet that i developed for for freeman benda actually you know so it's been really great to work with the gallery to kind of take it to you know much more ambitious and refined uh work um you know from from the monkeys or the slots that were kind of like almost like mascots to something much more functional as a piece of furniture which was the case of this cabinet and I love that yeah. in a way, Fernando. Uh, I, I mean, I love that your your design philosophy now is sort of like a milpa system in a way, where you're really thinking about like from the dyes to the materials to the diversity of of sort of aesthetics uh, uh, and aesthetic approaches to your work. It it all sort of ties to the same place, to the same logic, to the same system, uh, and it's sort of this terroir design that you were speaking about at the beginning beginning um, mixed with a milpa system of mixing and bringing together at the same place this diversity of options to make the system more resilient totally i mean i think you know and maybe this is what we were talking at the very, very beginning of the talk it's about you know crisis what what crises bring you are constraints you know and so i am someone that personally loves constraints loves limitations uh, and so, you know, I've been kind of like limiting myself to, can we work only? Sorry, I think uh, we're, I think you're breaking up a little bit, Fernando. Oh, can you hear me better there? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, it was about, what I was saying is it's almost like uh, working within this construction you know, uh, maybe because I kind of made my practice during crisis, you know, crisis is all about constraint. And I feel like, you know, I've with constraint and we're not indigenous material from Mexico from within this very kind of desertic area. Um, so it's almost like looking at how much you can make. And the agave has 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 become also part of the solution of how we um, solve the erosion problem, you know, and, and I'll be talking more about this in a second. Images of 
our nursery and agave, our, our agave reforestation uh, project. And sorry, this is a, a bit of a misplaced slide, but actually this is to show that a lot of the, the work that we do, you know, it's still going from a very kind of digital processing of, you know, working with a CNC machine and then trying to hide technology in a way by, you know, doing that last layer in a very craft and intensive, um, you know, melting program. Um, but yeah, maybe let's talk to the reforestation so we can mm -hmm. we can wrap yeah. things up because I think we're we're running out of time. So Fernando, could you tell us a little bit about how the agave and the agave fiber um, sort of approach helps again or goes back to this uh, conditions of of Tona Wixla and the context that you work with? Yeah. So you know if. If you look at this image, this is from a video clip that I did, and it just shows how devastated the land is. You know, this is essentially, it used to be a cornfield. Uh, all of these rocks that are sticking out from the ground, you know, used to be covered by fertile soil. So it really shows how bad the erosion has, has been. And this is nothing more than just putting an end to that indigenous agricultural system that had worked forever, you know, and how that switch had this massive, I mean, it was essentially an ecocide. You know, and so what what the main problem is, is we have a really heavy rainy season during the summer and then a very long dry season. And when it rains, it really pours. And when it pours, the water just because there's nothing holding it, it takes all the soil and the water never really filters down. So we have a really big problem of erosion and a really big problem of water retention. And what we're uh, doing is essentially looking back at indigenous terracing agriculture. I think that's on the next slide. And um, it's about creating physical barriers to slow the water down to allow it to filter down the bedrock. What, what we're doing is we've been digging trenches uh, every 50 meters, uh, which are leveled, and we plant agaves at the edge of every, every trench. And agaves are essentially pioneering plants. They can, they can start growing with no water, with, you know, they can grow basically on rocks. And what they do is they start to retain soil, they start to retain the water, the water filters down. And uh, if you look at the next slide, you know, uh, we've been doing this for the past eight years. And um, it's something at a massive scale. This is drone footage uh of the 180 hectares that we've covered with this trench system i mean we're talking at at, at the scale of a whole mountain um and mm -hmm. this is something that is a very very long-term vision uh project because we're we're only uh, about to have our first big harvest of agave after seven years of them growing you know so um but the way we've been financing and encouraging people to keep on doing this is th through the creation of all the all the pieces, you know. Um, I just laid this this uh, image in there because it's one of the images, uh, one of the pieces in the current show with with the gallery. But um, this is the wood from this from this piece was gathered from this super heavily eroded fields, you know. So uh, it was about like taking one of the skeletons of of these big saguaro cactus that died as well so you know when you think of desertification you you'd think maybe cactuses will survive but not even if you break that system where all the plants work together even the most hardy cactus die and so the the the, the wood of this this lamp is made with one of those so i guess just to conclude you know i think i think you know from my experience we we really have to diversify how we talk about sustainability I think we have to include indigenous communities within this talk. Why? Because they're the least responsible for the climate crisis, but they're the first ones to suffer from it. And it's because of what I explained earlier, you know, they are victims of the negative side of globalization without being, without accessing its advantages, you know. Um, and maybe we can go to the next slide, but, um, you know, I think what a, a big milestone of the project was I was invited to the World Economic Forum which is essentially, you know, a capitalist playground, but they, they like to invite people that maybe have a counter speech. And uh, and so when they invited me, I, I, you know, I thought, you know, it's always hard to speak on behalf of indigenous people, not being indigenous myself. And I thought this was the premium opportunity to give Delfino and Nicolás, who is the workshop leader in the town, 
and a, and a big ally in the project, the opportunity to speak about the challenges that they face. So it was an incredible cathartic moment because, you know, after seven years of working together, uh, they got to fly to Switzerland. They were guests of honor at the convention. It was it was really funny to see how they had a a, a more premium pass for the conference that the Minister of Finances of Mexico, you know, mm-hmm. and she was kind of <laughs> offended by that. Um, but yeah, they were guests of honor at Davos. They got to speak. They got they got their 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 moment to to express the difficulties of being indigenous in today's world. Um, and I think that's testament to that massive power of design, you know, and how a design prog- a project can can create this dialogue and these ties uh, between people that would never be exposed to one another. Just to wrap up um, before we move into maybe someone has another question, but um, I mean, it's been seven years since you've started this project. You're already you already have experience with a different sort of time sort of reality for your work how do you see this project and your work moving forward i mean are you invested in continuing with this specific community i mean how do you see the future of your practice i mean i hope this project with this community will go on for as long as long as i'm around and more um you know i think uh, even though i'm still super young it's always thinking about legacy you know, what, what you're going to leave behind. Um, but also I'm starting to look at other communities and other topics uh, still within this concept of, or this constraint of, of um, the market, then the market affecting agriculture. You know, our next kind of big project has to do with avocados. Uh, this will be, you know, a show for, for a big museum in Australia, but also um part of a solo show that I will be having with with the gallery later this year and um it's 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 a project that I still haven't published but it's a project that we've been working on and researching since 2018 so again a very long process um and and hopefully a very complete one uh this will be really dealing with things like violence things like the death of activists um and linking that to to you know how this is all kind of fueled by excess and mm-hmm. excess in consumption outside of mexico so so yeah um you know i think for the future this is how i want to keep on working um just um combining research combining documentary uh style research and 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 trying to plastify that in design pieces because I think that's where design can play a major role, you know, just kind of uh, presenting th- things that are very hard to talk about in a perhaps innocent way through an object, but charged with a big story behind. We look forward to what you have to show this year. Fernando, thank you so much. Super interesting conversation. I think it could take us another hour or more <laughs> to delve into it properly, but I think Renata, who's joining joining us from Friedman Banda, has a question for you. Yeah. Hola, Renata. Hola. Um, thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Maya. Um, Yes, I do have a question that maybe is a bit of a uh, operates in a, a bit of a different space than what you've been sharing. So I really loved loved what you said about getting to to get to the root. You have to get to the soil. And that's sort of how you penetrate the material culture that not I'm not surprised you weren't able to do somewhere else where there's no soil as as readily available to you. Mm-hmm. So in that material culture, I think, and I don't think you said it in these words, but I kept thinking of of how your work is this sort of veneration to a really sacred material. And so part of being part of that material culture and understanding that material culture is, you're taking care of something that goes beyond just sustenance for for these communities. You're taking care of something that's sacred and deity and at the core of that material culture. So I I think I'm just curious to hear from you how that notion of the sacred, you know, Mm -hmm. the sacred being corn operates in your work and how, yeah, for you, but also, you know, working with indigenous communities, that notion is very present and it's a, a national awareness, I would even maybe dare say. Um, 
so yeah just curious to hear about that and thank you for your wonderful presentation thank you um yeah i mean i think that's it you know it's about maybe trying to go back to this concept of you know i think the big problem that we've had as a modern society is that we've really separated ourselves from nature um and and we see nature as something that we can dominate and we can master and it's our at our disposal for consumption um and i think indigenous communities have this radically different way of looking at how we relate to nature we are nature at the end of the day we're just another animal um and so yeah it's about really like focusing on almost like the soul of the material and that's why a lot of my materials you know i don't really transform them too radically you know i'm never i would never like crush up the the corn to make like an mdf of corn you know because you lose you lose all of that all of that information and and that sacredness i think it's about almost minimum intervention and minimum transformation um and um when you're talking about indigenous communities i think i think this is another another aspect of it you know there, there's been a lot of talk about shifting from human-centered design to nature-centered design uh which is great but i feel like a lot of if you really look at all of, a lot of the problems that we're going through they're all human created problems so we shouldn't really move away that far from human centered design perhaps it's more about diversifying what kind of humans we're designing for um and i think this is a big part of of what i want to to kind of put forward with my design practice in relationship to sustainability as well you know it's about uh really talking about injustice and inequality it's a big part of the environmental crisis you know um i see it in 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 latin america it's more about like you know more than whether your disposable fork is compostable or not it's about how can how can we solve a, a social system where it is so unequal that for many people the only way to access you know basic human rights is to go and down cut down their forest uh to you know sell it as wood that's that's really the level at which we are it in in latin america and in places like africa and you know southeast asia it's really about still about resources and about you know just transforming natural environments into resources that you can sell and perhaps what we need to be going back to is this idea of the sacredness back again you know um um I think I think it's 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 about really looking at these communities that have managed to kind of live within this profound respect to nature and uh and and learning something from them. Great. Thank you so much, Fernando, for a for a fascinating um presentation. Uh stay tuned, everyone, to this special series of interviews. We'll have Stephen Burks interviewing Frida Escobedo. I'll be interviewing Tesontle in the next uh, few sessions. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing everyone again. Thank you. <laughs>